So data is becoming a bigger and bigger part of the products that people use every day. Product designers like myself need to rapidly embrace that data, and we need to begin to proactively define our relationship with it. Now, what I'm going to ask is that all of you imagine that you are also designers, and I want us to think for a second about the difference between designing an experience in the physical world versus designing experiences in the digital world. Now let's imagine that we have someone who wants to hear music. In the real world, they'll probably want to go and see a concert. They're going to come to our venue. They're going to try to find their seat. They're going to sit down and listen to that music. And because we were designing that experience, the decisions we made play into that experience for them. But they may have had a hard time finding parking. Parking. That staircase that we built to take them to their balcony seat might have been too narrow, and they had to fight the crowd to get there on time, or the band could be running late. There are so many steps and so many variables in that process that are completely out of control of the people who are ultimately responsible for delivering that music to them. And that's us, right? Now, in the digital world, the interactions, the flows, the music itself is all collapsed and condensed into a single screen, and it's usually one that you can hold in your hand. So what that means for you as product designers is that you have so much more control, but also so much more responsibility for that experience. And because it's digital, it also means that we can collect data throughout the whole thing. So what do we do with all this data? Data actually helps to inform us about how people are using our product along the way. But actually, data can also engage us in an ongoing conversation, where it helps us to hone and refine our customer instincts over time. But there actually is a danger, because as we dive into that data, we might get lost in the numbers. And something that we all need to remember is that data is a representation and a measurement of what real people are doing with our products in the real world. And rather than abstracting us further from human behavior, we need to think about how we can use data as a tool to actually bring that behavior into relief. So how do we do that? We can ask ourselves two very simple questions: What is it that people want to accomplish when they use our products? But also, how well are we doing at delivering that experience to them? So, if we go back to that situation I was just describing, the questions that we might ask ourselves are: How long did it actually take for someone to hear that music? And in that concert hall, did everything start on time? How often do they come back to our venue and hear concerts again and again? And in the digital world, we can ask the same thing: How long did it take for them to actually hear music? Was there anything in our interface that confused them or got in their way? And how often are they launching our app? How often in a day? How often in a week? How often in a month? So designers need to think about asking these questions. And asking the right questions, but also then taking that data and measuring the results. And they have to be able to understand the nuances of that data. Data can then help to empower and inform the designers to help make the right decisions along the way. But we do need to remember that data and design are just two tools that we use to actually craft experiences for people. So I'm going to dive into a little example here, and I'm going to use Spotify as an example. Spotify is a streaming music service. And when you take a product like Spotify that has evolved organically over the years, sometimes you look at what you have and you realize it's a bit of a mess, right? Light, dark. The people at Spotify working on this product knew that it was a problem, and it's not like the customers liked it either. Some customers felt that the lighter interfaces were headache-inducing. Other customers thought that the darker interfaces felt like Darth Vader. So between these two extremes, there really wasn't that much place to go, right? Well, actually, the designers decided to start to do some explorations, and as they did those explorations, a key hypothesis began to emerge: that rather than the existing experience, which was mostly light, a darker experience, which actually focused on the visuals and showcased the content. And by content here, what I mean is the music. The artists, the albums, the playlists—the things that are actually at the heart of Spotify—but that a darker experience would showcase that content, would actually be more engaging and make it easier for people to find the music that they were looking for. But now, moving to a darker interface across all the platforms was going to be a big change on those users, and we all know how much we love it when someone subjects us to change, right? 
Yeah, we love it. <laughs> no, this is actually going to be a big risk. And so what the team did is, along the way, they used standard best practices, user research, usability surveys to help inform them. And to me, all of this is data. Eventually, what the team did was they ran an A/B test, and this is where you take one to five percent of your user base and actually put them on this new darker experience, while the remaining percentage of customers stayed with the lighter experience. And what this really did is it allowed the team to test this new design in the real world, but not actually on the whole world. So what did they learn? Well, actually, when they looked at the business metrics, the people who are using the new design actually listened to as much or more music than the lighter interface. And when people were asked what they thought of the new design in surveys. More of them felt that it showcased the music, it brought the content forward, and in fact, they even thought that it had a broader range of music. So think about this: a broader range of music. Nothing had changed about that product except for the look and feel. No more songs were added. The catalog wasn't brought in, but yet they still felt that it had a broader range of music. So as the team moved from this to this, data actually gave them the confidence. That something that they thought was going to be a huge risk and a big change on their users was actually something that the customers wanted, and not only that, it was actually good for the business as well. But we all know that when we launch a product, we're not done. It's no longer the time when you only have one chance to get something right. Our products are in a constant cycle of experimentation, and so there was an internal debate that was going on within Spotify at that time as well, and that was about these play buttons, the buttons that are here on this cover art. Some people felt that it was really important to have an explicit call to action, so that the users knew exactly where to click when they wanted to hear music. And if your user base isn't that sophisticated, a visual cue like this can actually be really, really important. On the other hand, some people felt that those buttons were redundant and cluttered the interface, and actually they went against the principle of showcasing the music. So a test was done again, where these two designs were pit against each other. And what turned out was that the buttons were not necessary. People who didn't have the buttons played more music than those who did. Now I know this sounds like a small, minor, insignificant detail, but when the core of your product is all about playing music, a button like this can actually be the foundation of that experience. So the two examples that I just gave you show that data actually told the designers a lot of things. But what data didn't do is it didn't give the designers that initial inspiration to try a darker interface that showcased the music. Data also didn't start that internal debate about whether or not those play buttons should exist. The experiences that we design define the kind of data that we can and do collect on them. So in that sense, data is limited. But what data can actually do. Is inform us about how people are using our product and what happens when designers actually take a step back and try to look at the patterns in that data over time. Is that they might be able to extract design principles. They might actually be able to extract something about the importance of showcasing content and simplicity. And hopefully, they can take that knowledge and then apply it to future work. But data can actually tell us so much more. I'm going to take you back to that concert for a second. So. Remember that we were talking about a situation where you're sitting in the concert hall and we're asking questions to measure the quality of the experience. But we can actually ask questions that help us to be informed about the quality of the content of the music itself. In the physical world, we're going to ask how many people got up and left in the middle, how loud was the applause, how many people were sleeping. These are the same questions I'm going to ask myself as I depart this stage. But <laughs> As good an estimate as I can make about how many of you are looking at your mobile phones right now, the data that we can collect in the digital world is so much more precise and accurate, and we can find out exactly how long someone listened to a song, whether or not they listened to it over and over again, one time, two times, 27 times, 35 times, and with that accurate data, we can collect it on each and every single user, and this means that we have the potential to personalize that experience for so many people. But we really need to be careful about this power, because we are going to be tempted to deliver to people exactly what we think they want at that moment in time, and we're going to need to balance that with our customers' inherent need to control their experience. Digital media products now 
are more about personalizing of the content experiences that are contained within them, rather than about personalizing the interfaces themselves. So the relationship between the designer and data is going to continuously evolve, and our customers are going to change as well. As we enter new markets, as new tools and applications are built, our customers' behaviors and their expectations are also going to change. But unlike in the past, when we were bound by some of the decisions that we might have made about those experiences, like that staircase that was too narrow, we have the opportunity to change it. Our products now don't have to be static. The data that we're actually collecting on them is dynamic and precise. And what that data does is it fills the space in which we are problem solving as designers with infinite possibilities as we learn more and more about our customers. So the job of the designer is to harness and leverage the power of that data now more than ever. Thank you.